This week, we interview Feral Mavatuna to have a discussion about web application security. He's from NetSparker and very, very excited to have him on the show this evening. In our stories of the week, we're going to talk about hacking our coffee pots and a whole lot more. So stay tuned. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, the show where exploits run wild. Packets aren't the only things getting sniffed. Systems aren't the only things getting penetrated. Functions are the only things getting wrapped. Bits aren't the only things getting banged. And the cocktails flow steady. It's Paul's Security Weekly. Black Hills Information Security, the leaders in penetration testing and active defense. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com to request a quote today. NetSparker, the developers of the only false positive free web application security scanners, enabling you to automatically identify vulnerabilities and security flaws in all of your websites, web applications, and web services. NetSparker scanners are available in two editions, NetSparker Desktop and NetSparker Cloud, the enterprise online scanning service. For more information, visit their website at netsparker.com forward slash security weekly. Looking for a career change? Tenable Network Security is hiring everything from programmers to researchers. Check out all of the available positions at securityweekly.com forward slash tenable jobs. Pony Express. Check out their line of penetration testing devices, including the Pone Pad, the Pone Phone, and the Pone Pro. For enterprises, there's Pone Pulse, providing continuous visibility into wired, Wi Fi, and Bluetooth spectrums across all physical locations, including remote sites and branch offices. For all those hard to reach places, there's Pony Express. Visit them on the web at ponyexpress.com. Welcome, everyone, to Security Weekly. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian, and this is episode 442 for November 19th. That's right. 2015, 2015. Even. Mr. Jeff Mann is here with me in studio. Hi, uh, Paul. Welcome, Hello, Jeff. Hello, everyone. Wonderful to have you. I hope you can make more regular appearances. I'm going to try. Um, I'm gonna you know, try. we're without Larry and without Jack, so uh, you've pledged uh, to help us with that. So yep. I'll it's get, get fantastic. up here as much as I can. I'm uh, showing my support for Article 15 clothing. I don't normally plug uh, other businesses. However, on Veterans Day, mm -hmm. I made a purchase for them because the company's run by four veterans. And if you Google search for them, they have the funniest promotional videos on the planet, dude. They are hilarious. And as long as we're putting out plugs, uh, our cocktails tonight are brought to you by Bittered Sling Bitters. This they're Bitters a, is awesome. They're too. a Canadian bitters company. I got acquainted with them when I was in Vancouver a couple months ago. And a, a shout out to BitteredSling.com. Bitters, eh? Bitters. <laughs> eh? It's Vancouver. They don't talk like that out there. <laughs> no, they don't. <laughs> Um, on the lines via Skype, we have Mr. Michael Santarcangelo. Michael, welcome to the show. Michael Santa, Santa how do you say that again? Santa, Santa Colangelo. Santa you, you're, you're on the Asadorian scale of learning to say my name. So a couple That's drinks, right. you'll get it right. A couple, couple of drinks weeks. and about if only 50 I episodes you in person, later. I might have heard it and uh, been able to pronounce it correctly. Mr. Carlos Perez is on the lines via Skype from sunny Puerto Rico. Welcome, Carlos. Hey, happy to be here. Good to have you, Carlos. Time. Yeah, I know. It's been a while. It's nice to have you back, dude. This is going to be fun. A lot of fun. Uh, speaking of fun, you can have some fun shopping experiences. If you go to shop.securityweekly.com, that's right. You go there. Use the discount code Black Friday. Saves you 50% on all of the items in our shop. It's a blowout sale. <laughs> We're blowing it all out. We got limited edition hoodies. We got hack naked t-shirts. 10-year anniversary hoodies are up there. Uh, hack naked t-shirts in all kinds of shapes, forms, sizes, colors, you name it. Go buy it. 50% off. Discount code Black Friday. Go order some stuff. We got inventory to get rid of. We have a lot of inventory. A lot of inventory. We ordered a lot of shirts. Last year? Was and, that last and year? And the holiday season is upon us. And everybody last year. It must have been last year that I ordered a ton of shirts. Wow. And it uh, throughout the whole year, we've been selling them on the store and bringing them to all the conferences. And now it's gotten to the point where we're like, let's just get rid of them. So we might do something different. I think we're going to do like on-demand T-shirt printing. It's kind of where we're going. 
kind of tired of having the inventory. That's how they do books these days. Yeah. yeah. And I'm kind of tired of having the inventory. It takes up a lot of room, and it's, it's a lot of maintenance. So Is it a little depressing to have that inventory? It, it, well, inventory is evil, dude. I went to business school. Inventory is evil, right? It is. So it is. It's money yeah. down the drain. Yeah. Sort so, we're, we're, you know, get your hack naked gear, man. Yeah. It's good. It's good. Uh, Ferro Mavatuna is here with us this evening from NetSparker. Uh, he is the CEO and product architect. We're going to talk about web application security. Farrell, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for having me again. Yes, it's uh, wonderful. It's interesting you're on the show. I was just talking about a PHP application that I wrote that has command injection inside of it, and I was kind of amazed how easy it was to do that. Like, I'm very much like a Google-type programmer. I'm like, I know what I need to do. Conceptually, I understand programming because I've done that before, but I don't know the right syntax. So mm. I go to Google and I search for PHP shell exec thing. And I'm like, there's some code. Yeah, that's yeah. the syntax I want. Yeah. And then I'm like, wow, it works pretty good. And then I'm like, I wonder what happens if I put a, a semicolon in like LS. I'm like, wow, that's really vulnerable <laughs> to command injection. It shouldn't be that easy. Why is it that easy, Pharaoh? It's... You know, you mentioned you found it from the web. It's not any different if you look at the books. Mm -hmm. And not to mention, back in the day, it was quite common in the official documentation as well. So you could have grabbed some documentation from MSDN, Microsoft Development Network, and it will be vulnerable out of, out of that. I think the problem is we are still kind of fighting and getting there slowly is the frameworks, web application frameworks, will be eventually default by CQ. We are just not there yet. And, you know, until that, we will stick with, you know, insecure by default, then it's your responsibility to secure it. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, Linux and Unix operating systems went through that progression a long time ago. It seems like web applications have to catch up. Like, I can remember building Linux and Unix systems and the default installation was horribly insecure. You were almost forced by default to clean some of that stuff up before that system went in production because it was so bad. I feel like today it's a lot better. A lot of stuff is turned off by default um, and you have to turn it on. Um, but with web applications, I mean, if you build it, like you said, for according to the documentation, it's horribly insecure. And uh, that, that needs to change, I think, before we see a, a big increase in security of especially PHP applications. There is actually, there's another problem. Again, just before the show, we were talking about, you know, all these new languages, new mm -hmm. web application frameworks, and that's part of the problem. So we got this agile mentality, which is, which is good, right? But, you know, part of the problem is that when you move fast, you break things. And when you break things, you know, you got vulnerabilities. So we got all these new frameworks without clear best practice to apply to them for security purposes. And so many of them are patched on the way. For example, you know, Ruby on Rails, we, we have seen so many vulnerabilities in Ruby on Rails in the last couple of years. And now we have all these new frameworks and every single one of them got a different architectural problems or they still running into problems that's been solved in other frameworks. Like, you know, we, we keep seeing the cross-site request forgery is not, a cross-site request forgery checks is not enabled by default in these new frameworks. And when you're a developer who just learned the language, who just learned the framework, obviously you don't know all the tricks. And if they are not there by default, or if they are not clearly, explicitly explained to you in the documentation on, or all over the place, you will just skip them, and at the end of the day, your code will be vulnerable. So what I hear you saying is that the new frameworks aren't more secure out of the box because we've learned so many lessons over the years. You're, you're, it sounds like you're starting from square one all over again. Why is that? Why aren't they built more secure to begin with? It's, it, I think it would be maybe unfair to just, you know, call them they are as insecure as, let's say, PHP was. <laughs> uh, that, that would be quite harsh. But having said that, uh, it, it's similar with the browsers. If we remember browsers' evolution, like we had Intent Explorer and we have so many vulnerabilities on them. And then we had Firefox. And funny enough, you could have go back to all known Internet Explorer vulnerabilities that's been exploited in the past. 
and try them on Firefox. And half of them eventually worked, maybe in different ways, but we have seen so many similar vulnerabilities in browsers. I think it's the very same idea. As a developer of, of a new, uh, new framework, new language, your purpose is, you know, you're trying to get things done just like a normal developer. So your purpose is, you know, the most functional or whatever, the best design, but what you try to do is you try to get things done. And security is always a problem. You know, it, it's not a feature. It, it's almost a problem that you have to solve. Therefore, you cannot sell security or it's a very hard sell to your developers. Your pitch is not, we are secure. Your pitch is, this is the easiest framework to build web applications in 15 minutes. It's not, it will secure you, you know, out of these vulnerabilities, these vulnerabilities. I think we are getting there, but it's again, you know, part of the awareness problem because as a developer, when you shop for a framework, you're not shopping for the most secure framework. You are shopping for the fastest, easiest framework to get things done. Right. That's what I was shopping for. I'm like, I need something quick and dirty. <laughs> yeah. So I'm choosing PHP. Why, why did you do that, Paul? Yeah. And then I was why like, didn't you search for the fastest, most secure yeah. code no, that didn't. you could rip off? Because it was and the use. slowest to implement. <laughs> <laughs> I had a deadline. I had to meet it, you know? Yeah. So. But, that, but that's the classic. Uh, that's the classic tale. You know, you gotta, you know, you gotta write the app yesterday. You know, it's got to go to market. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, so it, you know, security is an afterthought, and it's still an afterthought. Yep. And convenience and speed and ease of use is forever going to trump security. And I, I understand why it's an after. I mean, it was an afterthought for me today. It was. It happened all <laughs> in one day. Dude. I mean, that's how fast, like, you know yep. what I mean? You can do this kind of thing yep. and make those mistakes all in one day. But actually, just this morning. Actually, it didn't even take a full day. And I could see developers thinking, well, I know it's insecure, and I'll, I'll have to go back and, you know, fix and do it, it later. later. But, but it's later still sitting comes. there right now, and it's <laughs> insecure because then I had a conference call, and I couldn't, yeah. Yeah. So and, and, somehow and again, you need to be publicly of, of chastised. <laughs> I do. I should be shamed. The bad I should be shamed for what I've you done. You should. You should. You know, actually, what surprises me, I understand when security is an afterthought in so many web applications where you, let's say, you know, if it's a Twitter, if, if it's an application where the security is not your first priority. But what we have seen uh, in the real world in the last couple of years, even the Bitcoin companies are thinking about security as an afterthought, which yeah. I never get. You know, you build a, a company all around money, security, and all that kind of stuff, and you getting hacked effectively means you are going to bankrupt or really going to lose money a lot, yet you still build a very bad web application completely insecure and you got so many problems. And that's what we have seen in the last two years, right? I don't know, maybe 10 or 15 Bitcoin websites got hacked. A couple of them were millions worth of money got lost or stolen or whatever. So well, that I don't get. <laughs> it, it brings up a good point, Farrow. It, it, it's one of the uh, topics that I wanted to cover uh, in this segment is that there are a lot of scaling issues in web security. Um, so how do you secure 100 plus websites with the limited resources that we have in IT security in a lot of cases? Um, I think that this is a really good situation where the security team is small, the number of web applications are large, but you still have the security requirement. I feel like there's a lot of people in, that, in this situation. Um, and I know that big companies like Amazon and Google are trying to, to solve these problems. So, you know, what's your best advice for, for people who are stuck in the situation of small IT security team, hundreds of web applications? It's actually a very challenging problem because what we have in the market today is first of all, I think we gotta get some things right. You know, the manual testing is always necessary. But, you know, as in your example, if you're a small IT team and if you are responsible hundreds of websites, then you have to bring in automation. That's, you know, that's the first thing to do. Now, the problem with the automation, it's still quite hard and it still requires so many people and, and infrastructure, hardware and, and all that. Uh, maybe lucky like for us, now the cloud is so easy to access, you know, services like AWS is so cheap. And therefore, now we got the cloud and I think now where the web application security goes, 
when it comes to uh, securing hundreds of applications, it's all about clouds. So what you need to do is you got to get an automation system and you, and you got to set it up in a scalable manner where you can go around and say, okay, I tested, you know, 100 application and that's my cat. <laughs> <laughs> I, saw you, right? I saw your cat in the background. Um, so the thing is, though, we don't, I mean, this is, this is recent. Until I think I would say maybe two or three years that we decided as an industry, as all the security people, we decided, okay, there's a problem. We got so many websites now and we don't know how to scan them. We don't know how to look for vulnerabilities. In network side of things, you know, it's a very well solved problem. And I think biggest difference between network security on scale and web application security on scale is the lack of protocols in web application security. So to give you an example, in network security, if you are going to test, uh, let's say, if you, are, if you need to authenticate to a server to test it, then the authentication is a very well-defined protocol. It will follow that. Mm. In web application security, what do you have? You have like 10, I don't know, like, you have 10 sort of standardized authentication, like various two-factor authentications and stuff, single sign-ons. And then you got every single developer develop some random way to do it. Yep. And then now if you have 100 of them, you got a massive problem. Yeah, you probably have 100 different ways that you're going to try and authenticate to all of these web applications, which is pretty much what I've encountered, and that is probably the number one problem that I, I've seen. Um, you know, tools such as NetSpark or, you know, give you shameless plug, sponsor of the show, uh, <laughs> make it easier, and a lot of the more modern tools make it easier where you can tell it, yeah, there's some authentication here, and a lot of times it'll figure it out, depending on, on what it is. Uh, and NetSpark does a good job of that, I've had positive experiences, but you've always got all of those fringe cases where the developers are just doing whatever, and that... It, it, I, I like your analogy because, you know, with on the network scanning side of things, you can use agents, you can use authentication, you can hook into password vaults. There are ways to authenticate that are standard. On web applications, man, it's hard, and that's a huge blind spot for a lot of organizations. So, like, how do you balance the manual testing with the automated testing? Like, do you, if you have 100 plus websites and you have a small IT team, do you go? And Michael, I know this is going to hit on one of your things. Do you go and ask for more resources to be able to test these applications? Um, let me tell you from our experience. So, you know, you mentioned about NetSpark. So NetSpark itself, which what we built about six years ago, it's a Windows application, effectively. It's a desktop application, and you run it on one computer. And about a year ago, we built NetSpark Cloud. So we took the very same web application scanning engine, and we put it on Cloud. Therefore, you know, if you have 100 applications, you can scan it in a day, not in, in weeks, because that's what it would take if you are going to, like, install it on 10 computers and hire 10 engineers to run them, get the reports on that. Anyway, so our experience from that, the best workflow is you set up everything, and, you know, we, we, we put in tools like, you know, uh, we try to address the issues, stuff like I've mentioned, like authentication, URL, right? we try to automate pretty much all of them. So, you know, you just set up everything and the tool figures out as much as it can. So the best workflow we have seen when you have such a large thing, automation versus manual or automation with the combination of manual testing, is first get an understanding of what you have. I've got 100 web applications, but what's the shape of them? If you are just scanning 100 of them, and when you get the results, if every single one of them have like some sort of issue, like SQL injection, command injection, random issues all over the place, then obviously, you know, you got a big problem. Before you do any further manual testing, you got to look at what you're really doing, you know. Maybe you need to think ahead and say, okay, first I'm going to patch everything as quick as I can. And then maybe you have to say, look, we got to change the way we develop things. If all these 100 applications are developed by the same teams, then maybe you should build a framework team build a framework which is secure by default, which is forces your developer to write secure code and makes the audit easier by design. And then you can say maybe, okay, you know, after we built this framework, by default, all of the issues will be solved and all the feature issues 
will be solved in one place rather than patching or monkey patching 100 applications separately. Mm. So where the manual comes in, when you got a good shape of applications, okay, you did your testing on 100 applications, and now and, now and then you had issues like cross-site scripting, you know, maybe a couple of local file inclusions, all quite common. Then you can say, okay, we got this covered. Now let's look deeper, you know, let's look into the logical issues. Let's look into what automation cannot find. Let's look into maybe enforcing certain policies that we want to enforce in all our websites. Like it can be anything from secure, you know, uh, authentic or account lockout to a particular forgot password policy. Like, okay, we shouldn't send emails like this. Or when, let's say, user changes their country within two hours and they are, you know, when you see they are logging from United States and then Europe in within short time frames, maybe we should lock them out and mm -hmm. send an email that we have a suspicious activity, all that kind of stuff. You know, you know Ferry, you, you bring up a very, uh, those. you bring up a very interesting point in that, that one of the pathways to having a secure web application environment is standardizing on a platform. Yep. And we were just talking. And, and so, Mike, are you, are you on board with that? I mean, you consult with a lot of uh, bigger companies that I know must have this problem. Um, how easy or difficult is it to get them to standardize on a single mm -hmm. web application platform? It, it's a challenge. But I'll tell you, you know, in that vein, I was talking to somebody the other day who was explaining how when you go in now and do an audit or an assessment, you know, if, if you have local domain admin priv or local admin privileges, it's, it's a big thing against you. Well, go look at how many development environments start with that as an assumption. Then go look at how many things we've built on top of it and then say, okay, now, now go standardize it. Now go fix it. You're talking about Linux. How many times have we done automatic build outs of stuff that we didn't harden it? We just said, yep, here you go. And the standard images had to get corrected. But, you know, what's interesting is as we were all talking, I mean, you know, my favorite question of late is what's the problem we're trying to solve? And <laughs> is it more people? No, it's the how do we create something that's more predictable? that's easier for us to test, easier for us to understand, easier for us to deploy. I'm a huge fan of standardizing it. And I think it is a challenge today, but, but that's potentially because we struggle to communicate the benefit of that, yeah. how that would lead to faster development, higher quality. I mean, forget the security side of it for a second. If I could, if I could demonstrate to the business that it would be faster development with a higher quality and, and that everybody would be happier with it and, Oh, by the way, it it would be more secure. Oh, don't don't say that out loud, though. Yeah, yeah you whisper that right with a wink, wink, and your your fingers crossed. Um, you know, I I think we're there. I, I think we have the pathway to get there. Let me say mm -hmm. that. Maybe, but by I, the way, I, I think the cloud. I think the cloud enables that. I think it does too. Hmm. Well, I was going to say. I mean, I think it. You could even step up further back, and and before you ask the question, what problem you're trying to solve ask the question of most companies that are, you know, the companies that are putting out these web apps, is there a problem? Do they even see that there's a problem? You know, the, the, the estimates this year for the holiday season is, is that there's going to be $83 billion made online transactions, you know, holiday sales. So, you know, if you're a company getting a good chunk of that, how much are you worried about some sort of compromise where mm -hmm. some amount of, I mean, you know, you know, if, at some point it becomes a numbers game. If you're making a hundred billion dollars and you, you and you lose ten million, which is a lot of money, but not to you, it's it's just a percentage. How much right. do you care about securing? But if things? you could spend a million dollars to make your application more resilient, and therefore your net gain is nine million, that's a smart business decision in my. It's a smart business decision, but there's a there's a qualifier on it, which is level of confidence, and we're. It, th this is the one place where when I look at measurement and security, I freely admit this is a struggle. It's almost more of a guess. So, Paul, if I said, hey, uh, I think it's I think 10 million is at risk. All right. How confident are you? 10 million is the number at risk. Mm -hmm. yeah. OK, well, I think I could fix it for a million dollars. OK, cool. How much of that risk then will you reduce and how con how confident are you or how confident can you make me then that my million dollar spend will turn into at least 5 million in savings. 
And well, that's, I mean, that's, it that's, might, that's, the, the number might be right, Michael. It might be ten million, but then there's the probability that it happens or not. Right. That's that's the confidence. That but if it yeah. if it does happen, what's the confidence uh, that you lose in your consumers and your customers that they're going to come back to your site again? And, and we get back to the community. Well, statistically, that. I think very little. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I the think consumer, the consumer public is, has historically been pretty forgiving of companies that have suffered breaches. Go ahead, Fer. You were going to say something? Yeah, yeah. I think that's that's part of the problem. You know, we've seen these massive hacks like Ashley Madison recently, mm -hmm. and before you know TJ Maxx in a couple of years. So we we are seeing these massive leaks. Adobe got hacked. So many websites got hacked, and all of your information got dumped. But the real question is, how much impact it's made to their bottom line? So that's, right. that's the real question. Right. If there is no loss of money at the end of a big hack, whether this is, you know, in some countries, and it's happened in various places, where when you got hacked and lost customer data, you have been fined directly by the government or whatever mm -hmm. the, you know, authority on top of you. If, if you have a bank, then um, the relevant... Um, relevant entity. So the key question is actually, you know, you spent this kind of money and what it means to be hacked for you. A as I gave an example, like if you're a Bitcoin company, you got hacked, you're done. You're done. You, you pack up and you go. You know, you, you can't continue that business. You're done. Right. But if you are a dating company, I don't know, it's still very bad. If you are a bank, it's possibly much, much bigger. So but if you're a retail company, I don't know if you are uh, something, maybe Amazon is too big, but let's say, you know, a smaller retail company, you got hacked, is the big deal? I don't know, because you don't store that much personal data anyway, but you don't know. It's how customers see it, interpret it, and in the next one year, what happens to your stock or what happens to your revenue? <clears throat> uh, along these lines, uh, for another topic, um that was suggested that I really like uh, is about the software development life cycle and, and how important it's gotten for startups in Silicon Valley and how huge companies today, Facebook, Etsy, Dropbox, I mean, the list goes on. I mean, they're pushing code multiple times per day. How are they able to stay as secure as they seemingly are today? I think the key question is seemingly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so what we've seen actually, there are, there are two aspects to it. Uh, some of them are quite successful at delivering results because, you know, they're obviously on the top of this development game. But there are other aspects of it. If you, if you follow up bug bounties, you've seen so many bug bounties done on Google, you know, Etsy or various other big, massive ex-startups, now big corporations, you see that they have all kinds of issues. You mentioned, co you know, command injection in your mm -hmm. PHP script. You can actually see command injection. It's happened in some Google servers. Wow. So we have seen all of these. I mean, it's not like they're actually secure completely. Otherwise, we wouldn't have 100 bugs listed within just like something like two years. It's insane. And these bugs starting from cross-site scripting to complete account hijacking or even command injection in certain levels. So I think the first thing to say, they are not really that secure, just like many other companies, because it's quite hard to be. But I think the second problem is the more complex environment you have, it gets even harder. So you've got the problem of developing quick and secure, and then doing this 1,000 times. You know, imagine Google, how many different environments, how many different systems, how many different set of applications they have. It's, it's a massive complexity. It's very hard to handle. Yet they fail now and then. I think it's quite normal. But on core, they are quite good. Uh, the problem is I think they are getting better. For example, you, you gave the example of Etsy, Etsy, which we talked before, and they had some issues in the past. But also I have seen a couple of the presentations they talk about, again, security in scale, and security uh, as a part of the development life cycle, which is obviously the right way to do that. Mm. And I think building, you know, standardizing, building a framework, ensuring your framework is good and all that, and, and ensuring that all of your development team understands 
how they supposed to use it, what are the security issues they might introduce. So, you know, training in that sense. It all helps to it all helps them to deliver fairly good enough code. But again, I think it takes every other month we hear one big issue about Facebook. Like you can read someone else's chat. Or I don't know, I think it happened five times that you can see someone else's private photos now. So it's not like yeah, they're actually... Facebook has a ton of code to protect too, though, and a ton of users as well. Right. And they're a huge target. But they're almost it, not a good example because every every mythical, hypothetical company we're talking about is not a Facebook with yeah. that type of code, with that type of, at, we hope, infrastructure and resources. Et Etsy's actually a really good example. They're smaller than Facebook. I mean, most websites are smaller than Facebook, right? <laughs> but most, most, they're smaller yeah. than Facebook, but they've got that security problem because right. they're essentially an e-commerce platform, right, where people can put up their own store. I mean, that's a, that's a challenging environment to protect. So I can see where they almost have to, you know, have that secure development life cycle. So I, I keep thinking about the, the need for a cultural shift. And I remember back to the beginning of the web and, and you know, the first browsers. And Are you going to tell us to get off your lawn now, Jeff? <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> All right. But I mean, in the early days, we had these punch cards and then an <laughs> abacus. No, no, it was, to, it was a tape. It, it was, was a punch tape. tape. It was punch tape. It's punch tape. Come on. You but in All the, the early days, it, it was, was you, you know the browser code. Everything was put out there, and it was kind of known that it was beta, and they expected the world to to do their QA. Um, it's you know, interesting. And, and we start talking about the S, and I don't know how much that's changed that that mindset. No, with bug bounties, I don't think it has. We're going to talk a little has. bit about that too. But you know, in terms of an SDLC, then you know, if you're a company that you know, we're talking about the frameworks. I'm using this this or that framework. It's new. It's old. I know it. I don't know it. But how much how much do I have to be personally responsible as the developer that's using this framework mm -hmm. to find vulnerabilities in the framework itself versus I should have some expectation that certain things have already been taken care of in, from right. a security perspective, and I can just use that framework as a building block for the code that I am writing, and I need to worry about the security of the code that I am writing. Well, I think that was a question. I I don't know. Well, I think that's where we need leaders in IT security to lead that charge to say we need a secure platform and, and help guide us towards having one framework, one secure platform where a lot of it is done for you. But you also need leadership to build security into that um, uh, SDLC, as Farrow was mentioning. And but then I'm, I'm the, kind of queuing up Mike here to, to get In the move going. to the cloud, though, we're going to have cloud competitors with competitive frameworks? Mm -hmm. And do we have the, a reasonable expectation that whatever cloud platform framework that we're choosing has, you know, has the building blocks built in, has mm -hmm. the basic security built in? Or is, you know, is there a way to identify the ones that are better or not as good? And right. is there a way to provide, to, to, you know, apply the certain kind of pressure to make it better mm -hmm. at the outset? Or well, is everybody exactly making a whole lot of money and it just doesn't matter? Well, well there's that's that. Where the leadership question comes in, and I, I think Paul nailed it. It's, you know, what I see as a great benefit of cloud is it's a forcing function. We have to think about stuff functionally now, not just technically the way we've always done it for the last 20, 30, 40 years. And in, in that translation, we're starting to see some nice changes. But when you go and talk to the folks that are doing dedicated security stuff in the cloud, they'll come back and say, you know what, we picked a lane. This, this is the part of it that we do, and we do it well. But we had to learn how to cooperate with this group and this group and this group. And so we're, we, we're unfortunately going to go through some iterations of which of the frameworks work. And, I, you know, I think that's kind of a misnomer. You know, in, in, just as a sidebar, in our industry, we, we have a tendency to misuse maturity models. We have a tendency to misuse frameworks. And then we, we do a lot of overlap and creation. And some of it's marketing, some of it's misunderstanding or whatnot. What we need to get to is a set of universal, universal principles, universal truths that we could all kind of agree to. And, but, but here's the thing. I think the cloud starts to force that. So here's the role that you can play if you're in an organization today. Ask the, ask the questions. Not like a jerk, not to be an adversary, but to say, how did you guys come to this? Why did you choose these things? How does that work with us? How are you growing in the future? How can we help you as you grow new things? How can you help me? And, and I think that's, that's going to be one of those ways that we can get to some of this stuff a, a little bit quicker. And I, I think that's a good thing. You know, it's, it's a mindset. Let me go back to Etsy for a second, too. Etsy gets written about 
uh, frequently, actually. They're pretty open about some of their processes. And aside from SDLC, I think it's a mindset. They're interested in moving fast. They're interested in, in iterating quickly, failing quickly, fixing it, and moving on. And I think what comes with that mindset then is not one of perfection. It's one of, all right, let's do it. Oh, that's a problem. Boom, we're on it. Let's go. And I, I'd love to, you know, this is coming to me now, but I'd love to start looking at some of these other companies that are doing that if, if that's not more culturally aligned with what we're looking for as opposed to those that are using, you know, they're still using waterfall. They're still doing monolithic things. They're still looking at break fix and, and QA as an on spec type of thing, et cetera. So, you know, where, where I look at it is I think it is a leadership and it's, it's that translation. It's that communication. It's talking about the value and it's pulling people in and not saying I'm from security and we tell you how to stop it or we're going to prevent it. It's going the opposite way and saying, how do I help you accelerate the business that we want to do? And in a way that is protecting, right? I, I don't think there has to be a trade-off. We're conditioned that there's a trade-off. And if you look at it, you know, UX has come up the same time security has. And they've been taught that security people are evil and will block everything and need to be stopped. And we're taught don't go to them because they'll just want to, you know. And so what I'm finding is I think there's a natural convergence now. And if we think UX when we're building security into the process, I actually think we, we can get something that's functional, effective, and secure. You know, it's interesting. We always talk about creating a security mindset, mm -hmm. and I think that um, we say that, and we're like, yeah, and then we kind of like we're done with it. But there's a lot of work that goes into well, creating that culture, feel, creating that we mindset. We feel good about that. Mm. But who are we talking to when we say that? Yeah, and I think <laughs> – And I wanted to ask Michael, what do you, define your terms. What's the difference between looking at things from a technical perspective versus looking at things from a functional perspective? Uh, at, at a high level, if I'm looking at it technically, right, um, I want a firewall. Now, we can we can go deeper and debate what a firewall is versus isn't versus next gen and everything else. Mm -hmm. But in the cloud, as a consumer of even a business to business consumer, I, I can't necessarily demand that I have a firewall. I have to describe the functionality that a firewall offers me. And then you have to satisfy that that functionality is or isn't met. And so what I'm talking about is I... I'm less concerned about using specific technology or specific jargon, but I'm looking at the functional outcomes that we want to have. And, and we're, you know, we're getting to a, a simpler, plainer language so to describe some of these. So spirit of the law versus letter of the law. What are we, what are we trying to accomplish by saying At the you need higher have, level, yeah. yes. Yeah, okay. Now, when you want to get down and say, well, hold on, I'm doing an evaluation, Michael. I, no, no, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying you want to bring other business leaders into it yeah, it's, it's more of a spirit, it's an intent, and it's looking for that mutual level of understanding. I want to come back to bug bounties. Um, Ferdy, you had a, an interesting story about, about bug bounties, uh, an interesting theory as to how it is right. influencing the younger penetration testers and mm -hmm. people getting into the field that maybe are applying to a security job and being like, yeah, I've got 100 bug bounties. Like, you should hire me. But what, what are some of the, uh, you know, uh, details there, Farrell? Right, yeah. Uh, so recently, I mean, it's been an ongoing process. We, you know, interview with security researchers and obviously security researchers on web application security field because, you know, that's what we do. And I've been doing it for more than a decade now. So, you know, I've got quite a bit of experience when I interviewed with someone... Uh, you know, I, I believe I kind of know what to look for. So what I've seen recently, so many people applying for the job, especially younger engineers, you know, or younger who wants to be security researchers, and they got these resumes, they got these CVs with full of bug bounties, which is, you know, which is great, because in theory, it proves that they can find vulnerabilities in real-world applications, and that's, that's good, that's mm -hmm. good stuff. I remember back in the old day, we would, you know, we would, it's still, I guess, the case, but it, it, it's getting less and less. We would tell, okay, I found those zero days in these apps, these, you know, these applications, these protocols or whatever, you know, these web applications, all that kind of stuff. So it kind of now uh, switched with bug bounties. Wait, so, I, I found a zero day in an application today. Does it matter that it was my own? <laughs> <laughs> but, it wasn't, but it wasn't really your own. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> Come on. So, so I, I've been doing these interviews and kind of a pattern emerged. You know, what happened is all this, especially as I said, the younger crowd who is kind of met with security 
when bug bounties just happened. And what happened is they immediately said, okay, I want to do bug bounty, so I want to learn and do the bug bounty. There is nothing wrong with that. So perfectly fine. So they sent me this list, and I'm, I'm going through the list of like so many cross-site scriptings and mostly cross-site scriptings, and then now and then you see other stuff. So when we get into the interview, I, I start questioning them, like, okay, you got this cross-site scripting, and let's say there is this kind of filter, what do you do? Maybe, now and then, they will answer, okay, I'm going to put this, or I'm going to put that, I'm going to put this character and see what happens. So sometimes the answer is correct. So you, they, they actually say the correct character. And to give you a more, you know, kind of a concrete example, it was the actual example, a local file inclusion discussion. So he said, I'm going to put a null byte. Okay, that's, that's actually a very good try. Okay, so my question was, do you know why null byte works here? And he doesn't. He knows not by works. He doesn't know why. He, mm -hmm. he, he doesn't. He can't make the connection between an actual string, you know, string concatenation in PHP kind of language versus what a C-based language would interpret that, like a you know null as the end of the string. Mm -hmm. But you know, for example, PHP wouldn't do that. So which leads to vulnerability. So my point being, what I've seen repeatedly. This is just an example, but I've seen so many other of them. They play for the end results, which is getting the bug identified. Right. I can make but, an alert box show up from cross-site scripting, but they have exactly. no idea what to do with it. Right. Exactly. That's, that's another good example. My other favorite question is, is about cross-site scripting. So I say, okay, imagine I've got an application in my intranet, and it's, you, know, you, you can only uh, connect it through a VPN. You don't have the VPN. But you know where cross-site scripting is there? And I am your victim, and I'm connected to that, you know, network. So can you exploit it? And lo and behold, many of them simply have no idea how to do anything on that. Mm. And, you know, even though today this is, you know, this is so much well-resolved problem compared to back in the day. Like we got tools like Beef, who is yeah. focusing on all these kind of exploitations, you know, where you can exploit the cross-site scripting that only the client got access to the you know, target website. And it again shows the lack of understanding of what the vulnerability is. And another good example, sometimes you know, we got junior researchers internally, we try to train them on security fields, and sometimes they come back to me and say, uh, I think there's a problem in here, right? Okay, I ask them, what's the problem? Let's say, they say, I can brute force it. Okay, sounds good. There might be an issue in there. So prove me how it works by numbers, right? The way I want to prove is, tell me how many requests you can make, tell me how many requests you need to make to feasibly crack that, and tell me how long it would take, and that there is no other protection that will protect it at the moment. And when they do the math or stuff, you can end up like, okay, it's going to take 10 years. <laughs> yeah, you know, they, got, they got this theory, but they, they don't think from the attacker point of view. Right. And attacker obviously thinks from the attacker point of view, nothing else. You know, all your focus is about exploiting things, not theoretically exploiting things. And obviously, you know, theoretical exploitation is a is a thing as well. You can think about you know a second layer of defense in that second layer of defense. You can say. This is secure encryption, but what if in one point, let's say MD5 is not that secure anymore, what would happen? Are we going to be insecure overnight? So you know, that's something you can think about it. But my point being, all these, you know, the bug bounties and similar approaches where you only focus that alert without the actual exploitation and without understanding why the bug actually happens is lead to a problem where we don't, you know, we get people who exploit stuff, kind of, but they don't really understand what they are doing in, in, in the level that's necessary. And it doesn't seem like many of them go that extra mile because they don't have any incentive to. Because it, bug bounty model rewards them just yeah. for that, nothing further. It's somewhat similar to, uh, you know, your, your point about... Um time management 
and time management as it relates to automated testing and time management as it relates to web application testing. How does time management play into both of those equations? In, in bug bounty or, or in the context you just mentioned? Oh, in the context I just mentioned, yeah. Right. Sorry, I was changing right. yeah, gears. Yeah, yeah. I do that. So, <laughs> no, that's, that's again, you know, he gets the mentions steers. about cloud scanning, you know, shape of your infrastructure and where the manual testing comes in. In a web application, I, I've said this repeatedly in many places, and it's, it's such a clear-cut case, yet so many people still don't understand it. Um, in a web application, you have so many parameters, you have so many inputs, so what we call is like simply a text surface, right? And in a cage web application, a fairly small one, you can easily have like 20, 50 inputs, so easily if mm -hmm. it's something dynamic. And if you are pen testing this web application to find vulnerabilities, what you have to do for every single parameter, let's say you are testing for SQL injection and let's assume you know what the database in the backend is. So let's say it's you know, MS SQL Server. So that means you know what the syntax to use. If you don't, then it, it's even more complicated. But to simplify it, you got 50 parameters. And what you have to do, you have to do at least about 10 attacks to every single parameter to prove that none of them are vulnerable to SQL injection. And that's obviously a very time-consuming task if you're manually doing this. Because if you put a single code, that doesn't mean, and if you don't see an error message, that doesn't mean it's safe. It can be a group SQL query. It might not respond with an error message. It might be a time-based, blind kind right. of SQL but, injection but also, that Farrell, you cannot even get a response. I mean, as you well know, in automated testing, yeah, you could test one parameter, but what are the values of all those other parameters, and do they impact <laughs> the success of your attack string in the first parameter? And now you've just multiplied the number of attacks and values you need to send to those, and now you're talking like... Hours to days or right. weeks yeah. of testing. Yeah, and that, that's where the automation comes in. You know, all I, I keep saying this because you know I've been kind of trying to um, defend automation web application security because you know I've done pen testing for so many years and pretty much solely on web applications. I've got a massive experience on the field as an end user, as a pen tester. I know it's pain to test stuff. And running into tests that some other people done before and done it in an automated way, we've discovered so many vulnerabilities. Not because mm. the other people were stupid or incompetent. They didn't cover the application as they're supposed to. Mm. So th that's what automation does. And then there are like tons of vulnerabilities. Automation simply cannot help you. And you need a smart individual who understands security to address those issues. Mm. So the, the way I look at the automation game, you have to automate what can be automated, and then you have to do your job in the manual manner. And you need to understand what your automated tools covered and what they didn't, so you can do what they didn't cover. And when you got that, you know, that, that's the whole thing. Speed up the process in an automated way, and it's not human, so... He, uh, your scanner will not miss a parameter because they forgot. Right. It's not going to miss a page because, you know, they forgot to get back to that page or they took the lunch break. You know, so well, that's that, yeah, right? and also, that coverage, you got that list. In <laughs> manual testing, too, I think it, you're, I like your uh, point about time management. And I was thinking about how that plays into when you're testing an application. And, and this goes to when you're testing outside of web applications, you're testing a network, you're testing anything. Right. There's multiple paths in front of you that you can go down, right? Which one of those do you go down first? It is only the experienced tester that knows my automated test completed. I know it can be automated, automatically found in my web application in terms of vulnerabilities. I know that there's these other paths that I can take to start manual testing. Which one of those is likely going to lead to success quickly enough? And, yep. and that's just experience. Well, we're touching on a couple different things here. To go back to the bug bounty real quick, what I heard you describing was basically a, a, a you know some sort of a risk equation where vulnerability is really on, only one variable in this you know whatever pick your algorithm that you come up with to determine risk. So I, I definitely agree that 
if if young people are coming in focused on finding finding o days and finding vulnerabilities and they don't understand that a vulnerability is only one piece of the puzzle mm -hmm. um I, I mean and then of course we're now we're talking about pen testing i used to do pen testing i used to review a lot of the uh, pen test reports for a certain compliance thing now that i'm not allowed to mention but uh, i used to argue all the time a critical vulnerability was uh, we found a, an FTP server. I'm like, okay, did you exploit the FTP server? Well, no. The probably Nessus results said it was an FTP server, <laughs> so that's a critical finding. I'm like, yeah, okay, there's an FTP server, but did you, did you? And I know there's problems with FTP. It's it's an it's an yeah. You know, it's, can you do anything? It's an with unencrypted it? you know, protocol. But did you do anything with it? Did you capture any credentials? And were they the same credentials? that gave you domain access? Did you even try that? Usually was it the just, answer was no. Was it just an anonymous FTP server where people can download files that are already public? Didn't matter. It was an FTP yeah. server. It's, yeah. a, it's a critical finding. It has to be fixed. Right, right, Without right. any context, without any understanding of, of, okay, what can you do with it? Which is really what we're talking about. Okay, you found a vulnerability, but what can you do with it? And in the real world... Not everybody is going to fix every vulnerability, but not every vulnerability leads to that total compromise in, either. In Paul's utopian world, everyone fixes every vulnerability. You should visit sometime. It's a wonderful place to be. <laughs> but in great part, this is Except for the, the code that you write. Except for in the code your that utopian I... world. But it's my world. So, mean. Go ahead, Carlos. Yeah, uh, what I was saying was that this is what the market is asking for. Uh, recently, I was asked to do a vulnerability assessment by one of my customers, and I gave him the proposal. And he turned it back like, you're going way overboard for the vulnerability assessment. I just want you to run a tool, give me a report so I can do my checkbox. And, and that's why we're seeing so many tool monkeys out there right. um, but it's, that it's only know also, how to run a tool. Whether that was a PCI kind of assessment, that's he, what he I said. It, not me. <laughs> no, and, and, and in fact, it, it wasn't PCI. Awesome. It is that uh, just uh, uh, for, for example, I was going to the customer. I want a vulnerability assessment. Oh, cool. How many hosts do you have in the hospital? What what are the machines that are exposed to people from the outside? Can I get a network diagram? I started asking a bunch of information. Then I had an SOW stating like. Uh, risk and hours and credentials that will be provided, co uh, uh, list of contacts in case something goes wrong, blah, 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 and, and all of the details that you typically put in a very well written SOW. And they came back like, no, 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 you, you don't get it. What we want you is to just run the tool and give us the report so we can check a box, fix whatever you, you exactly. do. And um, we don't have the money nor the time for that. We Spoken just like want to check a box. True QSA. So, so the <laughs> eight hundred pound check a box a the eight hundred pound gorilla that we're, <laughs> we're we're dancing around is the motivation for most companies to do any of this, which oftentimes is meeting some sort of compliance standard. I won't right. say it because you told me not to. But you know, there's a difference In this case, between HIPAA. checking a box PCI. and just doing the bare minimum that it's required, mm -hmm. and actually doing things that are going to make you to discover how secure you are and how much you can withstand. But what what you said earlier, Farah, that was significant is is really um, at the. I'm sorry, I think it was Michael that said it. It's not at the end of the day um, whether you're completely impenetrable in Paul's world, but whether you're doing some reasonable things to shut down the gaping holes, the obvious things that yeah. most lazy hackers and the bad guys look for, and and are you nimble enough to notice when things are going wrong so you can yep. detect and respond and react to them? Yeah. And about checkbox thing, I've got these, you know, uh, discussion with customers now and then. So they come to us, you know, talking about buying a tool and it, it comes to the discussion of compli compliance. And I generally flat out to tell them, look, if you want compliance, there are just so many cheaper tools that you can buy and sure. it will do the job for you. If you want security, as in an attacker can come and hack our website, then that's what we are in. You know, mm. That's what we do. That's the right. business we are in. And that's, as you say, it's the incentive what they're trying to get at. You know, some companies... All they want to do is just pass that compliance because they have to, and they don't care about the risk of all other stuff. 
And it's a discussion we have done at the beginning of the show, whether the risk is worth for them to invest or not. And some think it's not, then obviously, you know, uh, that's their opinion, and we cannot change it. Uh, so far, we didn't change it much. In the, but it's not necessarily yeah, that they don't years. care about the risk. It might be that they're un uneducated and uninformed and unaware. But it is a, it, you know, no matter what you call it, it is a risk decision. We might think it's the wrong risk decision. We might think it's a poor decision, but it's still ultimately a risk decision that right. they're making. And they're, they're, and more often than not, they're gambling that okay, maybe there's stuff out there that we don't know about that we haven't fixed that we should invest money in to fix it, but but until something bad happens, we're not going to worry about it. And and that's unfortunately, I think for most of our point of views, how most of the commercial world operates. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but let me let me just point out something that you just said that I think is important. Make that's it from quick, our Mike, because we got to wrap this up. Super quick. That's from our point of view. I call it field of view. Mm -hmm. There are people in the organization that have other fields of view. Some are bigger, some are broader, some see other pieces to it. And I don't think we're at a place where there's there, where there's enough evidence acclimated to, to help us understand when people have or haven't made the right choices. So I think you're right. I think there are things that are going to happen. And over time, we'll learn how to communicate them more effectively. We'll also learn how to evidence them more effectively. But in the meantime, we're looking at stuff from our point of view and that's not always the full picture. Yep. Um, Amen. Moral of the story, come to Paul's utopian world. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's fixing all of their vulnerabilities. Except Paul. Yeah. <laughs> Except me. Uh, check out netsparker.com. Go there. Uh, check out the software. It's awesome. Um, we, we use it for Security Weekly. Uh, it's a great tool uh, for scanning your web applications. Farrow, thank you very much for coming on Security Weekly again. Wonderful to have Thanks you as lot. always. Thanks a lot for having me, man. This was really fun. Thank you. Yes, good. excellent. Thanks. It was a lot of fun. Uh, with that, we're going to take a short break, come back, and talk about the security news for this week. So stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> 